And I remember there, everyone's like, hey, you got to do a powerlifting meet. I was like, what's powerlifting? <laughs> like, I, I still even didn't really have a clue. I knew we squat, benched, and deadlifted a lot, but I didn't mm -hmm. know you kind of pieced it together for a specific yeah, for an yeah, event. Yeah. 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 Time to sit down, keep it real, and cut the bullshit. Welcome to Table Talk. So Merrick Health is a premium telehealth platform specializing in hormone optimization and preventative medicine. Are you looking to optimize your health in and out of the gym, improve recovery, sex drive, and quality of life? Have you tried speaking to your health professional about this and have gotten the cold shoulder, stereotyped, or just told as part of getting older? You just go to MerrickHealth.com backslash Table Talk and you can create your own lab or you can take labs that we've had set up for them, which are based upon the same labs that I've been doing over the last 15 years. Or you can use their guided optimization. With this, they'll put you in touch with a patient care coordinator, which is actually pretty cool because you get to sit down and speak to somebody that can understand what you're looking for from hormone optimization and the preventative and medicine standpoint. After that conversation, they'll determine which labs that you should and which tests you should have done. And then from there, get the labs done. They'll review those labs with you and put you in touch with one of their hormone optimization specialists that can determine which supplementation that you should use over the counter or prescription. MerrickHealth.com backslash Table Talk. The discount code is Table Talk. All right, guys, we're back with another episode of Table Talk. Today, my guest is, let's see, you got my brother, <laughs> that's Stephen Granzella. Right? Yes, yes. Uh, former Correct. GM for Super Training, currently the marketing director of Merrick Health. And I put in here, you know, a 10 year amateur power lifter. There you go. And I like that because that's probably 90% of the audience of the podcast, mm -hmm. you know, so we'll have top lifters out and all that. And there's a lot that people can take from that, obviously, and good stories, but they're probably where you are as far as where it's prioritized. So it'll be an interesting conversation because it's going to be more direct, kind of what most of the listeners are looking for. Yeah. Um, I want to start with you. You were born with your bladder inside out. <laughs> yeah, right? yes, that's correct. So I can't go back further in your timeline <laughs> sure. than what that is. We don't want right? to memento it. Yeah, we don't want to yeah. go maybe a little bit forward, then go back, then yeah. go back and forth. Yeah, yeah, so I like to kind of work through the timeline. So that's sure. like the initial thing. Yeah. So, <laughs> so what was it like being born? <laughs> because you can't remember it. Sure, right? sure. So yeah. Tell me a little bit about it. Yeah, so, uh, well, first off, just thanks for having me. I really yeah. appreciate it. Um, you've had some absolute killers on this podcast. And just to be able to sit here in this chair and uh, speak with you and known you over the years is just an honor. So I just, yeah. I really appreciate yeah. it. It's been great. Um, but yeah, circling. So one day I was born and, uh, no, so circling into that. Um, yeah, you're correct. I, and it'll play kind of a factor for my, my whole life ultimately for the last 37 years, but I was born, um, with a condition called bladder extrophy. Um, essentially I was born with my bladder outside and inside out of my body. So, um, this happens in about one of every 100 to 300,000 children that are born, which is a handful a day, essentially. Um, and this being in the eighties, uh, things weren't, you know, the, the, the technology wasn't quite there to know ahead of time. When my parents uh, knew I was on the way, they weren't quite sure what was going on or what was going, you know, going to happen at my birth. Uh, but the story tells. Um, so I was born. And uh, when I came out, obviously some serious concerns. And uh, I was immediately ambulanced away from my mom. I was taken uh, out of my mom's arms and taken to a children's hospital um, a few miles down the road or in a city down the road in Oakland, California, where they proceeded to per execute one of the dozens of surgeries on me to try to uh, put everything back together. So from birth, uh, not for a little pity party action, but mm -hmm. I was given a given a hand right out, you know, right mm -hmm. out of the gate. And uh, that proceeded to to play a large factor in my life growing up. And 
uh, you know, self self uh, pity, if you will, definitely through through many years and frustration and anger and uh, sadness. How, how many surgeries? So in total, major operations. I think I'm sitting about twelve or so. Um, and how did they spread out? So at birth, um, they tried to they put my bladder inside and back in my body. I know at four days old, I believe they actually broke my pelvis and tried to restructure my pelvis because my pelvis was actually like, was, I, I don't know, I think it was encl enclosed too much. So now it actually sits a little bit wide. So I struggle sitting Indian style, mm -hmm. have some mobility issues with people give me shit about uh, in the powerlifting community, <laughs> yeah. but I just chalk up as I, I'm strong. That's why I'm not mobile. But um, so that proceeded. And then pretty much every year after that, and one of the most, the largest ones um, being when I was 11, that's where I had some major, major changes. So up until 11, I was actually incontinent. So I actually wore diapers until I was 11 years old. So growing up as a kid, uh, wearing diapers, being patted on the ass, being made fun of, uh, you, you get, you get yeah. very, you get very angry, get very frustrated, get very, uh, pissy with your parents, you know, why, you know, why me mentality. And fortunately when I was 11, uh, that, that was fixed. So that was, that was a great moment for me. So that was up in Seattle, um, with, a with amazing doctor that was able to work with me and, and provide me a lot of, uh, a lot of growth just for allowing me was to that kind the of last normal. one no my last major surgery was i think 2016 i had another another major one and since then just been minor little procedures uh scopings things of that nature but that was kind of the main the main one was 2016 what do they have to do you know moving forward so it's a lot of unknown so if if i could maintain where i currently am now to this day i still i catheterize actually i mean i stick a tube in my my stomach to urinate, um, which may sound weird to some people, but I am beyond grateful for it because mm -hmm. otherwise I would just be leaking, uh, which is, you know, yeah. out of urethra, which is not enjoyable to maintain. So if I could maintain what I have now, that'd be amazing. However, having had all those procedures, I have a lot of scar tissue, which makes things more complicated. So every time they go in there, they're dealing with tissue that is not healable that is you know already been ripped up so my options are pretty limited so again if i could maintain where i am now today i'd be a happy camper mm -hmm. so how did this manifest through school with your education and stuff like that yeah so growing up so you know up until i was 12 um you know first off hats off to my my parents i can't you know the older i'm 37 now and it really didn't hit me until the last 10 years and you know it, it hit me about 10 years ago how my parents, specifically my mom, must have felt giving birth to me and then immediately taken mm -hmm. from my arms. And, and looking back, my parents always treated me, quote unquote, normal. I played football. I wrestled. I you know did water skied. I wakeboard. I snowboard. I don't know how they did it. Like I, I as a, if I'm not a parent yeah. now, but if I put, when I put myself in their shoes, I just, I don't understand how it's possible they did what they did. I just, I totally don't, can't comprehend it. Um, having grown up with, or having had such fortunate parents and step, step family too, and my stepdad, it's just unbelievable. Um, but growing up, uh, yeah, dealing with wearing a diaper, being made fun of, always missing summers or, or taking some time off for surgeries or infections, series of infections, you know, you get made fun of a lot. People, you know, you're you're the freak, you're the kid, you're the weirdo in class, you get, you know, pushed aside a lot. And I have a, a, a very happy moment when I was 12 years old, I, I went to a camp, a summer camp for kids with bladder and bowel conditions in Colorado, in uh, Boulder, Colorado. My mom had found out about it through uh, a urology group, through one of our medical providers. And I met for the first time that I can know, I met other kids with conditions that I had or similar to. And I was, I was the first time in my life at 12 that I just, I felt, I felt a part of a community. I felt connected with people because here I am, we're talking about catheterizing or one kid has a, a, you know, a bag because he has Crohn's disease or, you know, abdominal issues and kids are in wheelchairs and, and we're just having a blast. We're going to amusement parks We're we're, we're making our own beds or teaching us how to be, you know, individuals and autonomous and all these things that I, I had luck, fortunate enough to have parents help me on that, but I was in a room with a hundred other kids mm -hmm. that were just like me. And I think that kind of stems 
my flash flash forward flash uh, to fast forward a little bit into powerlifting and my desire and love for having a community and a group of people to train with. But did you, did you find that through football and the sports that you were playing? So I am not an athletic individual. I am about five seven, uh, not <laughs> the most talented person. So I I I did my best in football. I was terrible, uh, terrible at wrestling. I enjoyed and was probably better more like wakeboarding, snowboarding sports. But I got into uh, or they had weightlifting. Right, we always have one or two days a week you weight lift in the gym and i was always chasing i don't know if you guys remember the charts where it's like oh you bench yeah. 125 for 10 times oh you bench 225 yeah. that was me i was chasing that chart we had a 800 pound club that utilized that chart that was a mix of uh, squat bench and clean mm -hmm. and that was uh, i got in the 800 pound club you know, looking back, utilizing the chart, unfortunately. So it was probably more like 400 pounds turned into 800 pounds. But yeah. um, so I, I enjoyed lifting to an extent, didn't really stand out, wasn't anything earth shattering, just was like something you did. I felt I was better at that than I was at the football part because the football part, you know, they had me an inside linebacker, mind you. So I'm five, seven. I have like all state people that are in first, you know, first uh, you yeah. know, ahead of me, two, three strings ahead of me. They're crushing it. And I'm just like the backup. I'm on the kickoff team, you know, receiving team, et cetera. But uh, so that kind of that kicked off my training and be about 16, 17 years old. And then I just got really out of shape. And in my worst, I was about 18, 18 to 20 years old. I got, I weighed at the time, 180 pounds, but just, just all fat, just no lifting. I was depressed, was, you know, wasn't getting haircuts regularly. Just look just like a schlub. I was going to a junior college. Um, and my grandpa pulled me aside. My, uh, he, my, my step grandpa, uh, Howard, we were at a, a family event, a Hanukkah event actually. And I was loading up my plate. And he made a comment about how much food I was loading up and it bothered me. Like it bothered the crap out of me. And I remember being upset, probably crying. My stepdad's like, what's going on? Talked to me outside. And it was at that moment, I actually started getting into the gym and making better decisions. So that mean, calm, mean, negative mm -hmm. comment that now, in, you know, being in the powerlifting community is an everyday statement, oh, yeah, yeah. but hearing it from my, you know, from my grandfather, it really bothered me, but it really got me into the gym. And then I became your average college gym bro, carrying mm -hmm. a gallon of water, you know, tight white shirts, you know, upper day, seven days a week, just all the stuff that we yeah. make fun of now was the phase that I started to go into mm -hmm. back then. And I was about 2007 or so. How deep did that phase get? I so mean, did you consider competing or anything like that? No, no, this is totally, my admirations were like Jay Cutler, Branch Warren. Like I wanted to be a bodybuilder. I didn't, yeah. I wanted to look like a bodybuilder. Let me rephrase mm -hmm. that. I wanted to look like one. So I started training at 24 hour and uh, you know, you know how it is. You see someone, you're like, that guy's pretty jacked. And we kind of train the same. Oh, he does lower on that day. I do, mm -hmm. you know, print. So we just start talking. I started befriending some people and we just started training together. So pretty much from 07, I had a couple training partners over the you know four or five years where we would just meet at 24 hour do uh you know lower do up primarily upper day i think lower day we trained maybe lower like one of the yeah, six days calves. a week yeah something <laughs> you know something silly we i vividly remember with my friend lauren him and i would do uh we did about a three four hour arm day every saturday that was our thing we did arms until we did like half of the rich pianas eight hour yeah. arm workout yeah. It totally makes sense. Just like inflame the muscle, you know, put as much blood in there as well, possible. Well, did it work? Uh, it felt like it worked. Yeah. <laughs> did my arms gain an inch and stay an inch? No, mm -hmm. but it, but it, I felt something, that's for sure. What were you in junior, junior college for? Uh, so I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I, I really wanted to get into law enforcement. So actually, so I went to junior college and just got my uh, general education. And then I transferred over to Sacramento State University up in Northern California for mm -hmm. criminal justice. Mm-hmm. And then did you finish with that? Yeah. So I got my degree in criminal justice and I started applying to law enforcement about 08. And that was about the time of the market crash and we had the housing crisis and everything. So it was really bad timing. I was applying for police departments at the time that police departments were letting officers out. Mm -hmm. So I still pursued it for about four years, uh, having many interviews, making it through backgrounds and whatnot, but never made it through the selection process. And it was honestly very tough. I was, you know, 
I, I went to school for criminal justice. My mind was set on it. Here I am doing, you know, six month background checks, going through everything, you know, being up front with everything I've done and, and, and just open with background investigators and doing lie detector tests. I mean, mm -hmm. the whole bit and then just not making it through. It was very devastating at the time. What were you doing during the time? So I was working for a uh, parks and rec district. I was managing staff for after school programs. So we had, there was a federal and state funded after school program in Sacramento that, that was at six different locations in my park district. So I was a manager of all the staff. So I was working with about 40 team members, hiring, you know, growing, managing, not the actual day to day they were on site doing, but mm -hmm. all the, all the hiring aspect in the, in the management of them. So how did the super training come in to be? So around that time, I started getting more and more into lifting. So I, I remember walking up to someone, I saw them doing a, what I now know is a deadlift. Like that's how bro I like. I was, I was just like, oh, it's not a curl, it's not a press. Mm -hmm. When I saw this really jack guy, it looked like Ken. He looked like Barbie Ken, and he was. I remember he was a bouncer with a couple of our buddies, and I saw him picking up a bar, and I was like, hey, what, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm, I'm doing deadlifts. I was like. Is that like back? Like, what is that? He's like, oh, well, it's like hamstrings. It's this and that. I'm like, okay, cool. So around that time, I started looking up more YouTube content and follow, you know, following people and, and just getting inspired. And I remember coming across Mark Bell's content, super training gym content. Now it wasn't what I was into at the time, which was that's powerlifting. I was more into, you know, I want to look like a bodybuilding mm -hmm. freak, but I started watching the content a bit. And then I came across a documentary called Bigger, Stronger, Faster, mm -hmm. which Again, as as someone that just it was the first documentary I'd ever seen that had you know fitness involved, and I watched it dozens of times, and I had no clue that mind you, Mark Bell was in the Sacramento area. I had, I had no no clue whatsoever. So I, here I am watching this documentary for one or two years. You know, it was, it was on Netflix at the time, so it's like oh, so it's like you're pumping iron. Yeah, yeah, it was my <laughs> modern day. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> it was my modern day pumping iron, hundred percent. And uh, a couple of years goes by and my friend Lauren, who I used to train with, he ended up going to a gym that was connected to super training gym. And he's like, dude, they have uh, Mark Bell's gym is in Sacramento. I, was, I had no idea. And he said, dude, there's a bar that's skinnier. It has no knurling in the middle. And when you deadlift it, deadlift with it, you get more out of the deadlift. And I said, what, what is the, like, I had no clue mm -hmm. what any of that was at all. So I was like, I got to check this out. So sure enough, I go on Mark. Uh, I think I found out on his YouTube or somewhere that he had, he had just opened the gym up for free. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, well, I'll go check it out. So sure enough, I just show up on like a Saturday or Sunday. I get there way too early. No one's there. I'm just sitting there by myself. Now, which place was this? Was This This is off was... 3rd Street. Uh, so this is, I th looking back, this is the third iteration of Super Training Gym. So is it I still believe. a part of the other gym? It was still part of yeah. uh, Midtown. Mm -hmm. I believe it was called Midtown uh, yeah. Fitness at the time or Sports and Conditioning or something. Mm -hmm. So it was a section of it. So he was still competing then? He was. Yep. Yeah. He was still competing. He was fat Mark mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. 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 Very fat Mark. So I, um, so I show up and I just, I did, they welcomed me. I kept my mouth shut. I l just lifted. I helped load. I spotted and I just, and that's when I, that was the first day. And that was August of 2013. Mm -hmm. When did you get sucked in? Shortly after that. So I joined in August, 2013 and my first meet was March, 2014. So I, I joined, uh, again, I just, I just kept my head down, helped any way I could. I remember the first time Mark helped me with the with my squat was about, I was there for a couple months and he came over randomly. I'm squatting 275, mm. maybe 315. And he walks over and he helps me with some positioning and gives me a little stretch technique. And I was like, I was pumped. I was like, holy crap. Like Mark just talked to me. He's helping me. Like what? Like my mm -hmm. mind was blown. And I remember there, everyone's like, hey, you got to do a powerlifting meet. I was like, what's powerlifting? <laughs> like, I, I still even didn't really have a clue. I knew we squat, benched, and deadlifted a lot, but I mm -hmm. didn't know you kind of pieced it together for a specific yeah, a total. for an yeah, event. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I said, okay. So I, I ended up helping in November. I was you know, loading plates at a meet for, for a meet that was at Super Training uh, in November of 2013 and then signed up for March. And uh, 
I got to experience what a what a peak was like, what, you know, what pushing yourself to the limits, what having a realistic number of what you can lift mm-hmm. in a meet on one day with nine attempts felt like. And uh, it was ever since then I got the bug for sure. How'd that meet go? I went nine for nine. I you know, I could have had more in the tank. They were huge proponents, like just get on the platform, just hit your, you know, don't chase PRs, which I ended up hitting PRs because I never really trained to that limit. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I I walked away with three solid, you know, third attempts and and it was good win. But I think I totaled 1280 is like just Mm -hmm. below elite through SPF or whatever. So it was 1200 something at 165 was my first meet. I how did you, fun. how did you, I don't want to pray this. How did, how did you stay drug free during that time? Terrified, uh, ignorant, no clue of what it was like, or I guess at the time, maybe it was actually a depiction of what it was like, where it's just your gym bro, you know? Well, I'm, I'm asking because of the movie too. So that what's funny is I watched bigger, stronger, faster. The drug stuff still excited me, but it wasn't the main part. It was just watching people that enjoyed lifting so mm-hmm. when they when they showed clips of west side or they showed you know super training gym and you had these guys just enjoying lifting that's what i did i just mm-hmm. enjoyed lifting i didn't go do a four-hour arm workout every saturday because yeah i, I ult, like i'll be i'm not gonna lie i did think it was gonna help me mm-hmm. but i genuinely enjoyed it i i, I still to this day i enjoy lifting mm-hmm. so i got to finally see people for the first time because you go to 24 hour people are going through the motions. Yeah. Like they're not getting after it. They're not smiling. They're not excited. Mm-hmm. They're just moving. And so when I saw Bigger, Stronger, Faster to see people actually, I mean, getting after it to a level I'd never heard of or seen or witnessed, that's what made that exciting. Well, with the training, as you move forward through those years with all those crews, a lot of those people in those crews are using, Yeah. right? So yep. how did you fight that urge? Fear? I don't know. I honestly don't know. I just, I was 20. Well, let me put it this way. It's easier to use than to not in this situation like that. Well, now I feel like a badass. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know. I don't have, I don't, I can't, I just maybe just fear of, maybe I think it just kind of falls under ignorance. I just didn't fully know what it was going to entail. I am also, I think I'll, I'll attribute it to my, you know, my experiences with surgeries. I am still to this day, I hate needles. Mm-hmm. Even when I get my lab work done, you know, even when I eject, you know, we'll talk about TRT and mm-hmm. stuff. I don't enjoy it. I'm less squeamish now about it, or I'm not squeamish now. But at the time, I had this envision of this inch and a half long needle, and you know, at the you know, not knowing gauge, mm-hmm. it's like eighteen gauge, yeah, you know, eighteen, 18 gauge, there, yeah. and you're just like you're jabbing it Plunging into there. Yeah. yeah. So I just I had a, that that alone was very fearful for me. Mm-hmm. And then when did you start working for Mark and how did that come to be? So around the time I started, I was actually working on a passenger train. So it went from uh, the Valley in California to the Bay Area, which was a couple hours away. And so, so what were you doing on the train? I was a fare inspector. So I was checking tickets, citing people, kicking okay. people off. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. It was it was a sweet gig. Uh-huh. Uh, it was long. But I, what I had was there were, there were basically 18 hour sh- days with about a 10 hour break or eight hour break in the middle. So they would put you up in this hotel in downtown San Jose, which was beautiful. So I'd have time to take a nap, get my food in, and then I'd walk over to a gym. I think it was Bally's at the time and get a good training session in. So I was doing that when I couldn't train at Mark's gym during the week and weekend. So I would go and I would start wearing the slingshot, the cuffs, the wrist straps, and people like, hey, like, oh, like that's some cool gear. And I'd be like, oh yeah, the cuff's great. It can do, you know, you mm-hmm. got elbow pain, it's what it can do. But well, how do I get that? And I said, well, you go on their website. I'm like, oh, well, let me go actually talk to Mark and see if I can just get it to you. So I asked Mark directly, I said, hey, I got people asking me about the equipment at the gym. Can you just give me, like the gym's free. Thank you so much. I'd like to give back. Can you just give me a bunch of stuff and I'll keep it in my trunk and I'll just bring it to the Bay Area and sell it to people? So I started selling slingshots, uh, knee sleeves, I don't think were around at the time, wrist wraps, cuffs were really common. And I would just bring Mark cash. And then every once in a while, he would just kick me down some cash, which I didn't ask for. Mm-hmm. I was just doing it as a thank you. And he would just kind of kick me down some money that way. So that worked out really well. Uh, and I was just being helpful. And then fast forward, maybe six months later, he knew I wasn't on social media. I just didn't, I didn't have a Facebook account. I didn't have an Instagram account. I actually utilized my wife's account at the time to like keep track of the mm-hmm. guys and what was super training and Mark and stuff. And they said, Hey, we want to start an Instagram account for, for slingshot. Like, 
do you want to do you want to run that do you want to start that and i said i'll give it yeah why not so i started typing in names that i could think for slingshot and came up with mb slingshot mark bell slingshot and so i started the first slingshot account uh for mark and then just ran it for the first few years and that was just a side gig so i was working on the train my 40 hours then i was monitoring posting you know, normal mm-hmm. social media stuff and, and way more reduced back then, right? There's no yeah. stories. There's no, yeah. everything was like 15 seconds. It was super yeah. limited on what you could do. Images. Very, yeah, yeah, very, very limited. So I was just doing that on the side. And then again, another opportunity uh, came, came up. There was Power Magazine which uh, Mark had been doing, Mark and Andy Bell had been doing for quite some time. And uh, they asked if I wanted to take over the sales of of the magazine. So I said, sure, why not? So I started selling to advertisers, uh, Eight Man Strong, um, some other, I think Rogue, some other uh, fitness. I'm not sure if I even elite at the time mm-hmm. and um, just started doing the ad sales for that. And then that moved into that spiraled again into the podcast ad sales. And then I did that for a while. And then ultimately, uh, they offered me a full-time job to come over for uh, a title is probably like marketing manager or something like mm-hmm. that. And so I actually left, I took a leap and uh, left the job, the, you know, the 401k, uh, great benefits, health insurance job for uh, slingshot, which did start incorporating it, but it was a job from a government job to and it wasn't quite a startup at the time. They had been around for a couple of years, but it was like a roll of the dice. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's how I started. That was my first full-time job with them. And that was probably 2015. So when you were there, how did your position evolve over time? Because you ended up doing about everything and managing. Yeah. yeah. So so at the time, I want to say there was a handful of people. There were people for the podcast. We had media uh, team members and then customer service and operations. So I want to say all in all, maybe like five or six people uh, in total. And so that encompassed the gym, which was like a separate business, which was free. So really just a separate facility. Yeah. Then you had the slingshot side, which is all the, the products. And so during that time, uh, a lot of my job changed from, you know, ad sales to also start mag- managing and uh, projects. So it's like, hey, we have a guest come in. Um, what are we going to do with the guests? Let's set up a photo shoot. Let's set up a video shoot. Let's get product shots. So I would start pulling all the necessary team members together to facilitate that. And I would just handle a lot of our our uh, guests that we had. And so that for another couple of years um, turned into the general manager. So I ended up becoming the GM, uh, working directly under Andy Bell, and uh, just started facilitating all of the management of our team. And at its peak, I think we had 22 team members Mm -hmm. uh, covering operations, customer service, marketing, uh, meet had a, like a six person media team. It was, so it was what big. was that like? You know, the ups, ups and downs of that. Yeah. So the, the upside was just to be a part of a company that was growing, like to, to be there when I, you know, I was showing up to work five years earlier in like a sweatshirt. And now I'm like, Oh, I should probably wear a polo and, mm-hmm. and some pants and not just gym <laughs> clothes. Cause then we're having deeper conversations and we're bringing in big guests, you know, to the podcast and want to be a good representation. Um, uh, on a downside as I was doing a lot of everything. So I didn't really become, became, I forgot the same, but I think I became like a master of none or, mm-hmm. or yeah, I basically, you know, I was doing management over here or I was doing projects over there and I just kind of was stretched. I did, wasn't, didn't have a lot of focus. And so to, to do that for a long period of time, you kind of stop growing. So I, I kind of stopped growing as, you know, my skill sets and I was just getting pulled in too many directions to try to facilitate. Did it become more reactive than proactive? Because with that many moving parts. Yeah. Yeah. I would definitely, that's a great way of labeling it, Dave, that that's, you become very reactive um, to problems and to situations. And then there's always a lot of last minute calls or last minute decisions that come up and changes. And you kind of just got to on the whim shoot versus having some proactiveness and and plan it out. Now, with some of the guests that you had out, what are some of the ones that are more memorable to you? Well, Jay Cutler, that that is definitely one the the bodybuilder, not the football player. Yeah. Some people, yeah. I tell my family, they're not in the they're not in the. No, I get it. No, I get it. I'm now, like, yeah. oh, I met Jay Cutler. Like, holy crap, you met. And I'm like, the football. I'm like, no, yeah. no, no, no. Yeah. Like, oh, who cares? So yeah, Jay Cutler is one that sticks uh, sticks out because I mean, I have. I've had his, you know, he, him on the cover of muscle development as a kid, you know, or not a kid, but teenager, just looking up to him and following his workouts and supplements and everything else. Um, Jay Cutler's one, C.T. Fletcher. Uh, I thought watching all C.T. Fletcher content before, I honestly wasn't a huge fan. I was like, this guy seems like kind of a jerk. Mm-hmm. I met him 
And I was like, I, that was one where I was blown away. I was like, this is the nicest human being on earth. He was the coolest, nicest person to me. And I'm just a guy. And I was just blown away. That one stood out huge. And mm-hmm. so every time I see him and see his progress with his health and everything improving, it's just, that's such a cool thing to see. Without mentioning names, what about nightmare guests? Do you have any of those? <laughs> I wouldn't say nightmare guests, yeah. but I've had some that were very unique and stood out and that maybe were a little little needy of, of things for sure. Yeah, mm-hmm. those definitely happen. Uh, but those were far, far between, far and few for, between for mm-hmm. sure. So it's, that was the, what's it, the power cast yeah so it had some iterations so it, it was originally the uh, mark bell's power cast i believe and then it shifted over to mark bell's power project and yeah. that's when in and then essentially over that time that's when in sema in yang and andrew zaragoza uh, mm-hmm. became a part of it and they've in, they've integrated to now i think partners actually yeah. on all of it so what was the transition between those two the, between the, 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 podcast. The, the podcast yeah so there was a couple other hosts uh jim mcdonald and silent mike that were there at the time and then over, just over time i think over a year or two span they had all parted ways and so they needed to shift over to a new new podcast mm-hmm. was it mark trying to position in different markets for a broader market for their departure uh, well, not really for that but for the evolution of the podcast I know. I mean, Mark's, you've seen Mark, like he's evolved a lot, right? Yeah. You, he's gone from a 330 pound fat oh, yeah. power lifter to a jack power lifter to a runner to a, you know, knees over toes, this or, yeah. or this stretching. So Mark just likes doing what Mark likes to do. Mm-hmm. So he's always, if he gets a niche into something, you know, in my experience, you know, as a friend or you know, someone that worked with him and, and still do to a capacity with sponsoring his podcast, he just enjoys doing what he wants to do. And if he does it, if he enjoys it, then he wants to to go after that market or go out mm-hmm. and work with those people. So that's been part of what it. Was the, what was the training like moving from gym to gym? Because you were in three, three? three. Yeah, three versions. Yeah. So the first gym was a lot more geared lifters. Yeah. So here I am, 165 pounds soaking wet, wearing medium t-shirts, natural to, you know, you got guys that are just gassed and they're they're lifting eight nine hundred pounds this is on the tails of like stan efforting doing his thing as well so him showing up from time to time uh just blown away and uh so that was very much like west side style Mm -hmm. like a max effort lower upper you know you show up you there's a board of what movements what accessories and you're like just pick them randomly or or i just mainly follow people right Mm because they know more than me and so that's evolved over the years too so i did i've done daily undulating periodization i've done linear um i've done back to you know uh conjugate style i've done pretty much everything and i've landed for the past two and a half years i've been under josh bryant uh, i've been un- under his uh training and that's actually been a lot of fun and that's very linear he goes in blocks and waves but he includes a lot of really cool diverse movements that it was up to, like i just mm-hmm. wouldn't think of to do so if you were to advise yourself on what to do 10 years ago training wise what would you advise yourself um that's a great question 10 years ago me uh well five let's go let's not let's not go back that far let's say eight five six years ago so this is so this i don't know how much more i've made the most amount of progress probably with josh so if i was thinking from a progression standpoint it would say maybe work with josh sooner but i enjoyed every minute no, of, course, of doing yeah. all the yeah. other training so yeah. i also i feel confident i don't live in regrets of man i wish i tried this program i wish i tried that program i feel like i've tried it all and gave it gave it my best shot so honestly i don't know if i'd change anything yeah well it's, the reason i'm asking is you know your training isn't your first priority right so well, it depends <laughs> well <laughs> in life yeah, or in life sure in, in life um and, because works up there you know yeah. the things are up there and so with that you have to kind of balance that yeah Right. And balance expectations and all the other type of things. So with the training now, is that easier to balance than say when you were trying to do conjugate and there's a big crew of people and stuff like that? So my last meet was in November and I would just it, this doesn't sound like much, but since November, because that's what, four or three months now. I am a little more relaxed on it because I do travel a little bit for work. I am more conscious about making sure I spend time with my family and we do outings and, and, you know, incorporate into, into just living life. Cause I'll be really honest for someone who's an amateur power lifter, 
not very great. I feel like I prioritize powerlifting like some of the stories I hear at Westside. Mm-hmm. In, like I, I mean, every week, I mean, I can probably count on two hands in a five, you know, five year span, how many weekends I missed of training. Okay. Like I, I did make it a priority and ultimately yeah, didn't yeah, get yeah. that strong in the scheme of things compared to a lot of the mm-hmm. other guests in yourself. Yeah. Um, so I guess I would say maybe looking back, I would say, don't be so rigid on training and be a little more accommodating for my own personal life. That would probably be actually the thing I'd reflect back on. So when you started doing that, did you start making better progress? Uh, being a little bit more yeah. flexible. Uh, it's I've been able to maintain the same progress. Okay. Yeah. And you like to do accessories. I do love accessories. Right, a yeah. lot. So the volume is going to be a little bit higher. Yep. Which kind of plays into Josh's programming. Yep. Yeah. And he does a great job because he, he gives me sets, reps, and rest periods. And so I follow it to a T versus if it was another program like, oh, yeah, just pick like three accessories and go. Well, that turns into 10 sets of 10 pretty, you know, I just make I'll just make it my own call and and go way too hard. And then sure enough, your elbows hurt, you feel beat up. And so when you were at super training, was there like Saturday squat day or were there certain days? Yeah. So then how are you able to manage that with? you know, those days, other program, like other programming. Yeah. Yeah. I would just, I would just match it up. And to be honest, a lot of the team historically super training was, you know, conjugate, right. Yeah. This, you know, Mark coming from, you know, with Mm -hmm. Lily and all that. Um, but it evolved over time. And so more people would come in with different training styles, but for the most part, I would say 90 or 95% kept the bot, the lower upper split the same. Mm -hmm. They made it work. So we like you might be doing, you know, a chains that day and I might be doing bands or or someone's doing a box. Either we're sharing a mono or a rack or you're just using the rack next to me and we're still working out together, you know, but then accessories might be different. Mm -hmm. So there was still a lot of camaraderie. And how how did that crew evolve over a period of time or die over a period of time? Yeah. So I want to say everyone you know, and sorry if I missed someone, but I would say everyone at that, the when I started super training gym, I can't think of anyone else that's still around or was still around before super training closed last October. Um, and then pretty much similar to the, the gym, the fourth iteration, I can't think of anyone or maybe a couple people. Actually, I got a John, uh, a john there drew there's a handful of people that are actually from the other iteration but there's really only a handful of us left so you're like the sole survivor i feel like it Mm -hmm. i feel like it maybe a little prideful about it sure yeah yeah Yeah. does that make it easier now though with your with your own training because there's not a whole lot of other people around there's pros and cons yeah so 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 even though you know super training's had a lot of different different training protocols and aspects and now the the gym's actually closed we still have i have about 14 team members that used to train up until the latest version that we still train together okay and i got them all training my program so it's just like hey this is what we're doing do you guys want to do it cool train with me follow along um we have some people doing their own thing but for the most part they're all doing the same program i am so what does that look like over a period of a week yeah so right now we have a four-day split i just got into jujitsu about a year ago uh which i'm terrible at just like football yeah uh and uh but that's been a lot of fun so josh cut it down from five days to four but yeah the split on that um, is a heavy lower strength day so we'll do squats deadlifts a mix a variation of the two um include some heavy accessories like hack squat or leg press and then some lighter ones and then we'll do a power lifting you know strong strength upper body phase or day with uh primarily start with bench press and, and move on to variations and then he basically has two you know fluff and puff if you will you know some belt squat hack or leg press lower and then the same for an upper day so, so how's that lay out during the week so that's Tuesday, uh, Tuesday max lower, Thursday max upper, and then I've been incorporating Friday nights for myself for for you know call it dynamic or lighter upper or a lower, and then on Sunday we'll do the second the last uh, upper day. All right, so you've been able to maintain the the heavy squat on a Tuesday, over yeah, this which has of been time, which that's is been the, rare. That's been the case for ten years. Oh yeah, yeah for for me. Yeah, so it was Saturday yeah. night, I presume. Uh, no, it, uh, it was, so we did have, so I, when I started super training, it was heavy squat, 
on Saturdays and heavy deadlift on Sundays. So the thing about super training that I can reflect on, I don't remember there being a lot of dynamic lower. It was like mm. squat heavy on Saturday, yeah. <laughs> pull heavy on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And, and there's sometimes you would do a dynamic version, but there was a lot. I feel like there was three of the four days a week were heavy days. Yeah. 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 So that just kind of carried over. So yeah. is evening or? Yeah, Tuesday, Thursday, start at 3 p.m. And then typically the team will train about 10 a.m. on Saturday, Sunday still. Okay, so yeah. two of the days are during the weekend. Yep. All right. Yeah. Okay. The, the reason I ask it, it's hard for people that are trying to put crews together because the weekdays become a little dicey. Yeah. You know, because it works. So usually they end up being the fluff and puff days. God, they swap it. Yeah. Yeah. And then the weekends will be the heavier days. Because usually it's easier to make yeah. during that time period. Um, how did Merrick come into play? Yeah. So so funny story is I was work so I was still working for Super Training Gym. Um and I was overseeing all the podcast sponsorships at the time. And I wanted to, oh, we wanted to open the door up to other sponsors. And I started pursuing um, um, telehealth providers, TRT clinics, if you will, you know, someone that could facilitate some diagnostic lab testing. And this is in 2021 in the spring. And so I got connected with Merrick Health, who is co owned by Derek More Plates More Dates, who at the time was really kind of kicking well he's been kicking off for a while but really kicking off around that time a few years ago mm -hmm. and um i said okay well let me pursue him and and i got on the call with uh one of the other co-owners mike stratton and a guy named memo canley who's uh who's now the clinical or has been the clinical director and uh bradham and ed, ed, ed Dembski, i believe it is he's a polish guy i always mess up his last name it's got z's and c's and y's in it um and we jumped on a call and uh, I worked with them for about a month. So we were negotiating different deals, like what can you do? Uh, I got my lab work done through them. So I got to experience what the process is like. And I, and they did a lab review with me and I was just totally blown away because, you know, prior to that, I would, I would try to fight to get lab work done. Yeah. Like, Hey, I want to get my lab. And I, and I, and I, Dave, this is no joke. I have been looked at in the face, go, you have a beard. You don't need your testosterone check. Like, I swear, swear to God, my wife was there, witnessed it. Thank goodness. They were like, yep, you have a beard. You don't need your testosterone checked. And I thought they were joking. They were dead serious. <laughs> so here I am in my mid thirties, like having what I would deem my first extensive panel done. I think at the time it was probably like 80 something markers. I had someone that actually jumped on the phone with me. It was, it was Brandon at the time and did a lab review. All of it's going over my head. Like I have no, I was just blown away. I had no concept of really what was going on. And he really broke it down for me and how I can make some improvements. He gave me some lifestyle uh, things like, hey, if you improve your sleep here, get maybe an extra hour, that'll help this marker. Uh, what's your diet look like? We make some changes. Uh, and then additionally, he went into like some supplements and even, you know, based off my age and my levels, my TRT, you know, testosterone replacement therapy could be a good option if I wanted to explore it. So I had a good sense of who Merrick was and, and what was going on. And then there was a day, there was a time in, I want to say May or, or June, May of uh, 2021 and um, myself and a couple other people from Slingshot were let go. So there was a transition period and I was, I was, it came to a surprise to me. Uh, Mark and Andy took great care of me on the exit. Um, no hard feelings. I, you know, I'm a professional. They're professional on it. And um, I spent the rest of the day, I was still shook. Like I was just blown away. Right. I spent the rest of the day and I emailed everyone that I worked with because I knew there was going to be burden on other team members. Mm -hmm. So I knew whoever was staying was going to have a lot to work to do just because there was a handful of us that were leaving and the work wasn't going down. Yeah. So I spent the rest of the day emailing everybody that I had worked with saying, you know, it was great working with you. Um, you know, I'm no longer going to be at Slingshot anymore here. You know, here's your new contact person, CCing them, et cetera. And uh, it was a Thursday, which is bench day. So I didn't leave because I had to bench that day. Yeah, yeah. So I stuck, I packed up my box and I packed everything and I just hung out and ate or whatever. I maybe got food or something because, uh, again, I had to bench press. And uh, I got a call from Mike Stratton and uh, one of the, the co-owners at American. And he's like, hey, like, what's the deal? What's going on? I said, oh, well, you know, was this let go? Like, you know, I, I hope, you know, it still works out with you guys and the podcast. And he said, look. I don't really know what you do. He's like, it's been really great working with you for the past month. I don't even know if there's something available at Merrick Health, but I know a lot of people. Why don't you read this book? I believe it was The uh, Happiness of Zen. Um, I believe it was um, over the weekend. Why don't you call me on Monday and let's see, let's see if I can help. 
I said, great. I really appreciate you reaching out. No problem. So I read the book. Essentially, it was all about things happen for a reason. Uh, you know, the whole you know spiel that we all we all know can, yeah. we can tell ourselves. But until you you know when you experience a hardship, yeah, all the crap that you tell people that goes out the window, right? Because mm-hmm. you're just like, this is happening to me. You feel sorry for yourself. You're panicking. So I reach out to him on Monday and we chat and uh, we chatted over about three week period and we had different ideas and I gave him a pitch for a marketing role. Like said, look, I can come in, I can do X, Y, Z. This is how I would do it. I gave him this big old doc and I pitched it to him and he was just pumped. And so I had a job offer uh, after three weeks and I said, can I start in two weeks? I want two more weeks to enjoy life. Mm-hmm. Rode my motorcycle a bunch, enjoyed summer. Cause I had, you know, you know how it goes. Like yeah. how often are we off, you know, knock yeah. on wood, it's good, but you know, you're ne- rarely between jobs in my experience. Um, you know, fortunately enough. So I want to enjoy a little vacation if you will. And then July, I think 11th, it was of 2000. 21, I, I joined Merrick Health as a marketing manager. So I was starting to oversee uh, all of the op- all the marketing aspects. And the company was only six months old at the time. So it was very new. Um, the space was was starting to boom. My full concept of what Merrick offered and did was not fully, I didn't fully, fully grasp it. It took me a couple, you know, took me a couple of days, a couple of weeks to really piece things together and what I could do um, with the marketing side. And uh what were some That's of the things it. that you weren't aware of? Yeah, so I remember part of my pitch. I w- I, w- I came in and I was like, "Yeah, we're going to set up an affiliate program. I'm going to do. We're going to do codes because we're going to track it." And I didn't want to over like cheapen the brand, but I wanted to figure a way to have strong call to actions. Mm-hmm. And with that, you know, you're very familiar. One of the easiest ways to compensate someone who's promoting your brand is to just give them a cut of what they mm-hmm. drive versus like a salary. So. I remember I created this whole program and and wrote it out. And then one of our call, first calls with the legal team, it was like, uh, yeah, you can't pay back. It violates kickback laws and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, that changed. let me go back to the drawing board yeah. here for a second and figure out. And we were able to navigate it with some business to business opportunities and salaries and flat rates and sponsorships. And it's all worked out. But I just remember having a moment of, moment of panic and going, oh, shoot, I need to. I need to rethink this real quick. Uh, what what has it forward. been like with the with the scale that it's risen to? Yeah, so it's 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 just dramatically increased. I remember, you know, without going into this direct figures, I remember the number that Mike pitched me uh, when I first started is, you know, looking back is it's laughable and in a great way. It's just like mm-hmm. holy smokes, we've grown this much. When I started, the team was about 25 people, give or take, uh, including you know, tech, leadership, uh, health coaches, et cetera. And I want to say we're touching on about 100 right now. Uh, and that's with like contractors and providers and everybody. Um, so the growth has been very rapid and it's been it's been very uh, we have to control it, right? Because we have a product. Our product, essentially, for those that don't know, Merrick Health offers uh, hormone optimization and preventative medicine. So what that means is we like to t- we tackle things with three pillars is we provide all of our clients with health coaches. Now, these coaches are not the medical providers, but they are ones that have uh, various education or degrees. Uh, Some are pharmacists, some are registered nurses. Um, They take the information. We take extremely in-depth diagnostic lab testing. And when I say in-depth and comprehensive, I mean it. Our our minimum panel is 84 lab markers. I think some of the tests that, you know, people that we know have gotten is well over 100 lab markers. Some of mine have been well over 100. Yeah, Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we really do. And there's, you know, companies out there that say, oh, take this at home finger prick test. And it's like five markers. Yeah. You got to jab yourself 10 times. So we, we don't mess around. And so we take that diagnostic testing and we provide touching on those three pillars as we provide the lifestyle interventions. So we'll talk about sleep, you know, nutrition, training, um, you know, ways to incorporate walks, like just common sense that we talk about in your audience is you're very much well aware of, but we can kind of, we can narrow it down to like, Hey, this lab, this lab marker and this symptom that you're having is correlated with X. All right, guys, we got new limited edition apparel. There's two designs, as with all the limited edition apparel. It's only while supplies last. This is the blue illusion tee, so I guess you can act like you're stronger than you really are. It's an illusion. And the other one, work harder, not lazier. Or you could just work really, really hard at being lazy. Doesn't matter to me. All that matters to me is that you support the podcast. So hit the link in the description or go to EliteFTS.com. And on the homepage, scroll down, you're going to see limited edition apparel. Click on there. 
pick up your limited edition apparel today. Help support the podcast, podcast, podcast. Thank you. So Merrick Health is a premium telehealth platform specializing in hormone optimization and preventative medicine. Are you looking to optimize your health in and out of the gym, improve recovery, sex drive, and quality of life? Have you tried speaking to your health professional about this and have gotten the cold shoulder, stereotyped, or just told as part of getting older? You just go to MerrickHealth.com backslash table talk and you can create your own lab or you can take labs that we've had set up for them, which are based upon the same labs that I've been doing over the last 15 years. Or you can use their guided optimization. With this, they'll put you in touch with a patient care coordinator, which is actually pretty cool because you get to sit down and speak to somebody that can understand what you're looking for from hormone optimization and the preventive and medicine standpoint. After that conversation, they'll determine which labs that you should and which tests you should have done. And then from there, get the labs done. They'll review those labs with you and put you in touch with one of their hormone optimization specialists that can determine which supplementation that you should use over the counter or prescription. MerrickHealth.com backslash Table Talk. The discount code is Table Talk. I think most of us would agree that getting a coach is a great step forward that an athlete can make to make greater progress. What if you had a whole bunch of coaches and a whole bunch of driven elite level athletes and like-minded people all in your corner trying to make you better? That's exactly what you're going to get with the Table Talk Discord crew. Would I join again? Absolutely. And I will continue to be a member of the Discord group as long as it's active. I've been a big fan of Table Talk over the last couple of years. It's one of my top podcasts that I listen to. So once Dave Tate announced that there would be a Discord crew. It was a no-brainer for me to join. It's been overwhelmingly positive experience. One of the biggest benefits of being in the Discord crew form checks. I work out in my garage by myself. I don't have people to cue me, to correct me, to coach me, anything like that. So being able to hop on the Discord, post my videos, and having elite top-level powerlifters and coaches able to give me real-time feedback that, hey man, you need to tweak this, you need to work on this, do some more accessories here has been a huge, huge benefit. I've seen my progression as a lifter make jumps just because of that. There's so much info on the Discord group for the members, thousands of articles, tons of eBooks, and really the best thing about it, it's like you're back in the gym, you're busting other people's balls sometimes. At the same time, you're getting really good information. It's been a blessing for me this last year, and I really recommend it. Well, well aware of and doing are two entirely different <laughs> things, right? That's a so, good statement, yeah. While, you know, it's a different audience, the, the, the issues are still the same. Yep. Maybe even with, with the core audience that's looking just to get jacked big and strong, it's more important and more over underlooked yes. than with the others. And then when it's suggested, it's like, ah, you know, whatever. You know, so so and with the three pillars, we really like to touch them in that order. So that's where we hammer. It's like, hey, just walk more. Just even if you're on a bulk, like bulk or you're like, let's get these little profile markers down a little bit or let's let's just get you moving a little bit more. Um, so we'll touch on that. And then they'll also go over over the counter supplements. So this could be vitamins, minerals. Uh, we work with, uh, we you know, you know, thorn life extension, just quality supplements, not just low budget ones on mm -hmm. Amazon that people are quick to go to and then they figure out why their supplements aren't aren't functioning well. Um, and then we also, the last thing, it's one of our key factors is we have partner with medical providers that are focused on in hormone optimization. So there's a difference between fixing sick, pe sick people and preventative and optimizing people. And this is where you and I have experienced, you know, insurance or a provider denying even testing, let alone mm -hmm. care. Uh, of optimizing our health. And that's where the medical providers are able to work with our clients to provide them with ways to optimize their care through compounding pharmacies. So we partner with about seven compounding pharmacies. We're, gonna, we're always adding more that provide over 600 different treatment options. Now, this could be the various levels of EPA fish oil that is you know, pharmaceutically compounded to um, you know DHEA or testosterone replacement therapy, HRT hair loss prevention, cognitive function. I mean, there's there's a slew of of treatments that we offer in addition to the lifestyle and supplement options. Yeah, the the guided optimization 
is underutilized as well because mm-hmm. the, all some of the roadblocks that you talked about, you know, the doctor because you have a beard. Yeah. You know, e- even if somebody thinks that they have low T, which at this point they probably do. Sure. If they suggest it to a physician, you know, there's there's pushback. There's all kinds of crap. Then even if they get the prescription, there's issues from the pharmacy or from the insurance company. Yep. You know, because the prior authorization, loop of hell, you know, and all these other things to where it's 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 interesting to kind of see two different tracks emerging. It's like you have this insurance track, then you have this private pay track, which is yeah, I see it in physical therapy, I see it in the hormone optimization, I see it in medical care. And it's vastly different. Vastly different. And it's good if you can afford it. It's bad, you know, if you can't afford yeah. it, right? Because it's I mean, if you if you project this out over a long period of time. You know, the, then yeah what's it well what's it going to be for the people that can't afford it you know it's just going to be shitty medical care yeah. which is kind of what it is now for a lot but if you can't afford it then it, there's a big difference between the that private pay and and not huge just in regards to speaking to the physician at all right because the first is the kickback no you don't you don't need that you know or and you could or they have no idea how to even read the labs Right, which was one of the things I hear about most of the time is they it's odd, right? Because they'll go in for their appointment, then they'll take the labs there. Mm -hmm. And then maybe they get a call. Maybe they don't. Yeah. From the from a doc from a primary primary care. care, And it's like, ah, you know, your this is your cholesterol's too high. You know, here's a statin. Yeah. And meanwhile, you have no idea about any of the other stuff or what may even be driving that. It may not be that. Yeah. You know, it's all this other stuff where with Merrick, it's a different conversation because there's 80 markers, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's 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 crazy when you listen to people that really know that stuff inside now. Like, well, that marker's off because this one's a little off, but because this one's a little off, we need to now look at this one. And it's like, what what the hell are you talking about? You know, and it's that's where you guys specialize in being able to do that because sometimes the treatment option isn't just you know here's the blood pressure med or here's a stat and it's like no this is super low and it can be vitamin mineral whatever it's going to be i'm not a doctor yeah and or just walk just move just move yeah just right? move. and then either it's corrected and you don't have to spend 40 years yeah. on some medication that you didn't really need in the first place it's just because one marker was off in the they knew how to read one marker you know it's crazy to me and it's what you touched on you touched on a little bit too so so with merrick you you can just go to our website and order labs so if you if you are someone that can interpret labs or you have a friend or something again just because they can interpret labs doesn't yeah, mean they no, should I, no, or no. The, yeah but there's plenty of people that just want to get some basic markers or they just want to track it over the years maybe let's just use male and testosterone because it's a common one it's a hot topic i have friends that just every year check their test levels because they know eventually they want to get on testosterone they need it now yeah but they want to like like, oh, let me track three years, and if I continue to decline, and they don't need a medical provider to look at a number and say it's down, it's down. Well, you guys have the report with it too. So, so with Merrick, so with just the diagnostics, they can just get the labs. Yeah, it doesn't come with the report. But for what you touched on, and what makes Merrick so valuable is if you go through a guided optimization, like you called it, they'll get their own concierge health coach. They get someone to review their labs with them. They get the medical provider. They get constant care, like communication and care. So they get people that actually take all of those labs and see the correlations and connect the dots with how they can be improved. Because just like you mentioned, if if your primary care checks like just your cholesterol and they're like, oh, your cholesterol is high, let's do X, Y, or Z medication or action. Well, maybe there's another marker that they just didn't check because insurance or them themselves yeah. just aren't aware is the culprit or could be, you know, coinciding with that issue. Mm-hmm. So that's, you know, and that's where we really, really strive is, is making those connecting the dots and providing evidence and scientific based care, which is the key part. And that's always a changing, evolving information's you know, data and information is always changing. Well, the other thing too is optimized isn't the same as normal. Correct. Right. And yeah. that that's a big area too, where most don't know how to navigate that. Yep. Because something could be high, mm-hmm. right? And flag high, but that could be optimized. Yeah. Right. So. And 
and some people that are in the normal range still don't feel as as ideal or feel optimized for instance so there might be some markers that need to be just outside a range maybe perhaps and there's there's always some and this is ultimately on the medical provider that has to get you know has to make this decision because yeah. they're they're trained on it but um you know there there's reasons why there, there's a range and, and ultimately it's how we feel and how we produce what is the fastest growing demographic that you guys are seeing that are that are joining merrick mm -hmm. yeah so our primary is 35 to about 45 years old that come to Merrick. So they are, you know, they're established a little bit. They, you know, they have their career. They maybe are starting to focus on their health and wanting to feel better. Um, they have maybe a little bit more money to spend and actually start caring for the health. Cause just like you mentioned, medical insurance is only going to cover so much, mm -hmm. but in the end, think of how much stuff money you might save actually, if you actually preventatively take care of yourself yeah. and optimize yourself down the run. Um, but that's, that's kind of like our main. So they're coming group. in proactively. They're not coming in reactively because yeah. something screwed up. Yeah, we get a lot. Well, we get, but we do get yeah, both. We get definitely both, yeah. get both. Um, but we do get a lot of people that want to optimize their health. So they're, they're aware of like what a protein source is. They're aware of, you know, a training protocol or they're already in the gym to a degree. Um, we do get individuals that, you know, maybe don't even understand what a you know chicken breast to chicken thigh difference is in terms of a new you know basic nutrition we get individuals like that and we're able to help them as well but we really strive when we're able to provide people that already have a, like a basis of uh of what they're looking for how's the attrition rate been it's been really solid so we, we maintain an overwhelming majority of our clients that we come that come to the doors um we do have i mean i'll be very fr frank we do have an extensive process we provide um we have diagnostic labs that are we do in the very beginning of the process and then essentially every six months after that so we want to make sure that our clients are getting regular blood work they're getting checked in addition to that we mandate an annual medical physical from a provider that someone would get in person, urgent care, primary care, yeah. you know, insurance covers most of them if you have insurance, um, because we want to make sure the health of the client is is in a good state or what we can do if it's not in a good state. We don't want to put someone on a, you know, something that's yeah. going to raise their blood pressure if if we didn't know they had elevated blood pressure. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a lot of things that we take the step for to make sure that we provide the best care that there's just other places or, you know, that just kind of skip that step. And we want to make sure that we're providing the necessary and quality care to our clients. All right. Now for the athletes, you also help to mitigate. So how much of a demographic is that? Yeah. So that's a part of it. It's not, you know, it's a good chunk, but it's not an overwhelming yeah. by any means. But yeah. yeah, just to touch on yours, we work with, we're non-judgmental. Like people come to us, we ask them about, you know, the supplements they're on or drugs and this and that because we need to get as much information to correlate it with their lab work so we might have we have bodybuilders power lifters strength athletes that sure they're on performance enhancing drugs we're not the place that's going to give them performance enhancing yeah. drugs but we can help them with their thyroid we can help them with their insulin levels we can help them like mitigate risks that they're on from a non-judgmental place and so we really like to provide that to we like to really art, articulate that we're able to provide that services to the community that you know you're making a decision for yourself you want to be the strongest the best you know most muscular person let's see what we can do to help you do it the safest possible way well i think that's another big what i want to say sales point um bullet point put mm -hmm. it that way because many of them are using their online coach sure you know to be able to review their labs yeah and it's, it's crazy to me yeah that how you know, it just does not make sense there, you know, but it's, yeah. In the underground labs part too, a lot of people are getting, you know, their supplements or treatments from who knows where. Well, yeah, I call that test club for men. There you go. You know, yeah. cause you know, it's for a few years I did that, Yeah. you know, and it's, they give you the list. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, what, what do you, what do you want? And it's like, wait, huh? Yeah. Like, but then that's one side of me. The other side of me is really, yeah. You know, it's but, excited and scary at the same. Yeah. Time. Well, it never really ended up being what it was supposed to be either. Yeah. You know, so there's that problem, and um, there were a lot of problems, and then they get shut down. Yep. You know, so there was that problem, and then you're just chasing a source. Yes. Over and over again. Yes. Yeah. So how has your own personal journey been, right? Because then you start, and then yeah. 
you know, you eventually go on TRT. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Which let's let's define that real quick because that's become very oddly defined in recent years. Yes. To where TRT has become the new natty. Right. Yeah. So sure. You know, it's if if they take a thousand milligrams, it's TRT anymore. Yeah. Right. But they say that because they want it to make it look like they're only taking a hundred milligrams, but it's a thousand. So there's a difference between cycling yep. and TRT. Yep. Right. Yeah. So TRT is testosterone replacement therapy. And so replacement is yeah. that, right? So let's say, you know, the, the a, a normal hospital or insurance, a lot of them goes anywhere from like 200 to 1,000 for the most part. We find a lot of our clients do really well, like in the 800 to 1,200, maybe 1,300. It really just depends on their, you know, them individually, along with their other lab markers. Like, yeah, I was going right? to say other things matter. If, if you're at 800, but all your, you know, your cholesterol, your lipid profile, like everything's good, but then you bump up to 1,000 and then you're having now side effects or lab markers are compromised, you know, is that really, is the 200 worth it? So, or if you just feel like crap. It, which does happen, yeah. which we always think more is better, right? Mm -hmm. So that's that's kind of the definition of TRT. Then you have people that are like, oh, I'm just on like sport TRT, which I assume people like taking 500 milligrams a week. Yeah. A week. I don't, I mean, I would just probably more associate that with like a, a lower cycle. Um, but to circle to my own journey, I started, I was 34 years old. I had been getting my lab work done and Stain Efferdine had been like reviewing it um, over the years. I had gotten my lab work done consistently for like the four years prior. And I went from, you know, I was 31, 32, it was in the 800s. Uh, then it went to like 700, 600, 500. So I consistently over like four years went down 100. And I would argue my diet and training got better each year. Like I feel I was less fat every year. I had better understanding and started working with uh, nutritionists, um, you know, to focus on my you know, health and how I looked and performed. So it was steadily declining when I joined Merrick. So I joined Merrick um, and I got my labs tested and I was, you know, low and TRT was an option for me. And so being very hesitant and apprehensive about needles, I started off with the gel. I was like, well, like, I'm not ready for needles. Let me start with the gel. And for you, you guys that don't know, gel or cream is something you have to apply either to your scrotum taint area or like an unshaved part of your thigh, like kind of the sensitive skin. Um, but it's something you have to leave on for a while and let dry. So you can't have, you know, sex later. You can't touch anybody. The, the, it can't touch anybody because it could transfer. So if you had sex, you know, with someone or you had kids and you hug them and maybe it was on your arm or wrist or something, it could, it could transmit to them. So I remember there for a couple months, I'd have to rub cream on. I'm just like sitting on the couch, God. just like, just letting it air dry. And I was like, man, I'm like, I'm starting to feel better. Like libido skyrocketed rapidly and I'm starting to feel a little, little better. Um, nothing like earth shattering. But I was like, man, this is, this process kind of stinks. You're doing it every day. It's, you know, it's, just, it's, it's something. So I then started an injectable testosterone. And so, uh, and for me again, super terrified of needles. You know, I'm using a half inch, 27, 28 gauge needle in the, in the Dell or ventral glute, which is like above the butt cheek, essentially. Uh, I'm not gonna say you don't feel anything, but you really don't feel much at all. And so that really like took that stigma away because I, again, thought I was going to be using a, mm -hmm. a big old needle and it was going to hurt and it was going to be like a harpoon. And and so that, that, that started shifting. Um, but the first three months or so of starting TRT, I had... I felt a little better, but I actually experienced a few weeks of really severe anxiety. I, I actually kind of, I went from feeling a little bit stronger, starting to feel that pump in the gym. But then there was about two weeks that like, I'm, I mean, this is going to sound a little over the top, like everybody's starting to get me, but I just had like, whoa, it's like something's not right. I don't feel very well. And so I got my labs done again and we checked them and made some adjustments to my, my TRT dose. Um, and I, you know, within a couple of weeks, I started to feel great. And then it was, it was after those three months that I started to make some progress in the gym again. I started to feel better. My confidence boosted my, it could be coincidental, but like my home life improved my work life, like everything just improved. And it's a silly thing to say, but my mindset really kind of shifted. And when I say, you know, the gym improved, I'm not saying like my bench went from 400 to 450 a couple pounds maybe, or I just look a little bit leaner. 
it wasn't a, you know, it's again, it's TRT. So it's not like all of a sudden I became this monster. I just started to feel a little better. And having been a natural power lifter for so long and had benched in the, you know, low mid fours for an extensive period of time to actually start to see some progress after, you know, doing that for four or five years without any progress, it's a, it's a huge positive uh, change. Were there other compounds you were using? No, just testosterone. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No peptides. I had done peptides before uh, for a glute issue that BPC, TB500, and that was kind of opened the door for me because I had significant progress with those. Those mm-hmm. have been fantastic. And I still utilize those to this day if I have an injury, mainly, mm-hmm. mainly BPC. Yeah. So I shifted. So that's been, that was two and you two years ago two and a half years ago um and i've just made adjustments ever since and the last time i got my labs tested about a month ago i was sitting at like 1280 uh test levels uh i feel really good my strength move you know my strength's been really good and strong um again the mindset factor i just i can't even put into words like what it, it carries over to life like it just it enhanced kind of every aspect of my life um which could be a personal thing so i don't want to people to think like oh i do trt in my life my career is gonna oh, take yeah, off yeah, and yeah. i'm gonna you know have a girlfriend or whatever it is like you know but that just my own personal uh experience just feel a lot better so you you said you're training with josh now so are you actually what are you training for so I just had my last meet in November. Um, How'd I had a, that go? Yeah, I had a great meet. So so bumping on TRT, your mu- like I started holding me with some water, gaining some muscle. So I went from competing at 181s to 198s because I just also didn't want to. I was already straddling the 190 yeah. line. wasn't worth cutting. Want to enjoy the bulk a little bit. Um, so at 198, I squatted 540, which uh, I'm not a big squatter. I think my best ever, in, you know, wraps is five or five fifty one. But I did five forty in sleeves. I benched four sixty two, uh, which was a PR for me because leading up to that, prior to TRT, my best was four eighteen, and I think I did four years of. I think I did like eight meets, roughly five, mm-hmm. five to eight meets over a four year span. I benched four eighteen, um, so finally saw some progress after a few years of training on TRT. Mind you, it wasn't instant at all. Yeah, um, and then deadlifted six hundred. So totaled 16, I think 01, 02, um, which again, that's why I say amateur powerlifter. I, it's a hobby for me. Mm-hmm. I enjoy it. I will continue to do it as long as I enjoy it. Um, you know, every meet, I'm always like, why am I doing it? Like, yeah. you know, <laughs> why am I doing this is my last meet? But then I, then I, I, after the meet, I then started to get the, you know, oh, okay, I want to do another meet. So I'm torn right now what I, whether I want to do a meet or not, but um, which I, which is, Maybe I'll do a jujitsu competition or something instead. Um, but uh, yeah, maybe maybe later this year I'll do a meet. I just enjoy lifting. Again, I enjoy lifting. I enjoy lifting heavy. So Josh has just got me doing, he had me doing a pretty extensive, like a three-month hypertrophy phase, which was a lot of fun, really challenging. And now the weights are starting to go up a little bit. I'm on a little bit of a bulk right now. I'm sitting about like 205. Um, so I got about nine more weeks of it. So I just told Josh like, Maybe we'll just go for a, a big lift at the end of it, and then I'll start cutting down. Because I also work with Justin Harris for nutrition, as you know yeah, very well, yeah. uh, which has been a which has been great. And so my plan is to. I always say this every year. I don't know if you do too. I'm going to get lean for summer, mm-hmm. but I really mean it this time. I want to get. I want to be a little less fat for summer, which I will anticipate some strength loss. How long did it take you to get acclimated to the carb cycling? Um pretty quick so i worked with uh john heck before who worked under justin for a while worked with him for a while so i started with him four four ish years ago five years ago um so i'd been doing carb cycling for a while and then even on my own i was adhering to it 80 percent of the time 85 percent of the time but for me there's a huge difference between 80 85 and like 95 100 percent of the time and when you're either paying someone every month or have that respect level for their time it changes your adherence yeah so even to the point where i had icon meals sent out to the airbnb here every time i travel for work i'm sending meals out or i'm finding a local spot um because i don't want to do i don't want to i'm doing my check-in every week and I don't want to waste Justin's time. Mm-hmm. And I respect him enough to know that, you know, he's being very generous with it. And I want to make sure I'm living up to his his expectations. So it's I've been pretty pretty damn on point. In town, I'm, you know, 
95, 100% on point week to week on the road. I've had sometimes I'm a hundred percent, but it's more than that 90 plus percent. How much difference would you say changing your diet made to your training? I would say the training wise, probably that's a, that's a tough one. That's a good one as well. But my training, I don't think due to my nutrition has improved that much. I feel how I look has improved because of it. Um, Oh, that's a tough one, Dave. Actually, the more I circle, because then I start to look at other lists. I've had a lot of progress while working with Justin mm-hmm. in in uh, you know alongside with Brian on my lifting side. So that's actually a tough one. Well, I mean, let's say going back before that, before yeah. working with anybody. Well, if we're just comparing that, then it makes a huge difference. Okay, yeah, that's where I'm going. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then yeah, if we're if we're looking at if we're strictly looking at before Justin, before John, then yeah, then it's made a huge impact. Okay, yeah. and how so? Well, all my, I mean, I'm leaner than I was. I am, I have, you know, more muscle mass. I've outlifted every lift before that. Um, I've, you know, performed better in and out of the gym better. Yeah. Any injuries that you've had to overcome? So in 2016 or 17, I tore my left, my underhand bicep deadlifting. I was, uh, it was my last, this is great. It was my last uh, lift one week or 10 days out from my meet and I had strained it a set or two earlier, but I had like a strain in my forearm and I was like, eh, that's weird. Like it's not my bicep, like it's my forearm. So, yeah. so I put a cuff on it and I'm like, I'm fine. Like I'll be fine. And sure enough, my, it was like 521 was like my last pull of before the meet. And so I gave it a pull and sure, sure enough, it rolled up on me. I got, there's video of it too. So it rolled up like an inch or two and it didn't hurt, thankfully, but it, it did feel very weird. And I was like, that's not, something's not mm-hmm. right. I, I, I dropped the bar and I can, you can see me just like looking at my arm. Like, I don't think that's supposed to do that. And uh, sure enough, yeah, I detached it, distal bicep tendon uh, detached. And so um, that's probably been, that's probably been the biggest actual injury. But one of, one of the biggest um, challenges is I, Post that injury, that's my left arm. It was my left bicep. I continued lifting and primarily safety bar squat. And Did you have it repaired? I had it repaired. Okay, yeah, yeah, sorry. I know a lot of people don't have it repaired, yeah. but I had it repaired. I mean, I'm a bodybuilder at heart. I, yeah, I got yeah, to yeah. look some. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so I do. Uh, I continue to train, but I find myself favoring the good side over and over when I lift. So if I'm doing safety bar squat, I'm holding with one arm. I got one arm, you know, strapped to my yeah. chest. And over that, those six months or so, I think I underdeveloped my left leg to the point where my, um, one of my tendons and my glutes just got extremely aggravated anytime I push. So it took about three, four years of having tendon issue to the point where I would deadlift. It would kick in so hard at the top of the lift, I would miss. Or I would go do drop sets and my glute would just crush me. And it wasn't until I actually started BPC 500 or BPC uh, 157 and TB 500 that I actually saw progress. And it, it, went, it went three or four years without doing anything. Do you think then, if you would have instituted that earlier, it would have made a difference? Yeah, I absolutely do. Because I was on the verge of doing... Um, uh, stems, not stem cell. Uh, what's the one before stem cell? Um, prolotherapy. No, it was injectable. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. So I was, they were going to basically stick a. They showed me the needle. They were going to do this huge needle into my tendon, like six inches in a cortisone. No, it wasn't right, cortisone, okay. but yeah, it was, it was yeah. something gnarly. And I, and I, I remember looking at the guy, I'm like, I'm not, I'm not doing that. Like, that's not what I'm doing. And so I started doing research, spoke to some so spoke to some people in the space and i heard you know the wolverine stack right like tb 500 bpc mm-hmm. and i was like i really hate needles but it's a small needle and i can't like i'm it's, it's hindering my life not even just work like just sleeping hurt walking hurt like i gotta do something and so uh i remember i injected myself monday night and tuesday morning and it's lower body on tuesday and for accessories, we go through squat and there wasn't anything major that would have maybe activated it. But I get on the GHR and GHR was a movement that it kicked in. I felt it instantly. And I got on the GHR and I do a rep. I go down, I come up and I 
Dave, I kid you not, I didn't feel any pain. And I was like, I started to like tear up because I didn't feel pain for the first time in like three years. Now, I found that the more I push it, the more pain did happen. And I had to still continue to, to take care of it. It took, it did take a while, but I went from always for three years feeling instant pain if I did a movement involving my glutes to to no pain to minimal pain and it was a great movement and that kind of helped great moment mm -hmm. and it really kind of showed me like oh there are things out there that can actually help you recover that's not just you know foam rolling yeah <laughs> yeah all right through through merrick and through super training as well you've been around a lot of different people mm -hmm. in the industry um are there any people or any advice that any any of these people have given you that has made a difference and carried over to help with work life training balance any of that well that's a good one i've i've had the opportunity to meet hundreds of people in the in the industry um and spend time with them have meals with them hang out with them pick them up from the airport and that's a really tough question there are some that stand out that gave me the time of day or interacted with me at a higher level that I was just really, that really impacted me positively. Um, and they stand out to me. Uh, Jay Cutler being one of them. Uh, Chris Duffin has been another one. Um, but I can't think of a, a direct quote or a direct piece of advice that someone maybe gave me. Um, but I can just say like, to this day, like reflecting back on CT Fletcher, I can to this day, I can think back to seven years ago when I met CT and it still brings a smile to my face. I can feel how happy I was meeting him, um, you know, six, seven years later. And I can reflect back on that. Mm -hmm. um, I assume you guys are going to have a booth. No, mm -hmm. no, no. At the Arnold? Yeah. Yeah, no booth. So it's actually a small group from Merrick. We're, we have a lot of partners, affiliates. I know you have John Jewett coming on, mm -hmm. Stan Efferdine, uh, Foad Abiyad, it will be there. So I'm actually just utilizing this time at the Arnold to walk around, say hello to people, introduce ourselves to some new people and find any new partnerships. And just and networking. Continue. Yeah, just networking, which is the best, to be honest. Booths are great, but they're, they're a lot. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's where I was going to go because you've been there before. <laughs> yeah, right. I've done the booth many yeah. times. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> without being too catastrophic, you know, how did you like those experiences with the booth and being there? I so so mo all my booth experiences were with Slingshot. Yeah, and we always had Mark or we had Brian Shaw, and we always had guests. So we always had a line, and we sold product there. So knee sleeves, wrist wraps, all that stuff. It was just nonstop. We had people coming up constantly. They're beyond exhausting. But a lot of fun because mm -hmm. everyone that's buying, like no one's coming up to the booth and's like, oh, I need knee sleeves. They're coming up to the booth like, oh, this is Mark Bell's knee sleeves or you're in SEMA or Smokey or whoever. Like they're coming up for a reason to either purchase or engage with you about something. So that's that that was a lot of fun. But yeah, they're, they're a lot of work for sure. All right. With, with you being the one that's kind of like vetting out partners and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So, you know, part of your job is to find, you know, the people that have influence, but also the people that are really good mm -hmm. at what they do and may not have as big of influence as far as followers. Yep. I mean, like followers don't mean everything, right? Correct. What What matters is if they know what they're doing, if they can represent the brand. Who would be some of those people that others may not know about? Because they don't have hundreds of thousands of followers that are ambassadors for your brand that you've vetted out that you think people should know about. Yeah, that's a really great question. So to your point, there are, there are so many people out there that have maybe smaller brands or smaller audiences, but they're very, uh, they're diehard. They follow uh, 100%. I would say for this community, and it's not necessarily a, it's going to kind of be a little different than what you're pitching because they're out of the space, but they they still have a large following. So yeah. like Chris Williamson, uh, he's a podcaster. Uh, he has a podcast called Modern Wisdom. Uh, we've had the opportunity to sponsor that a couple of times and we'll continue to sponsor that. He has a huge following, but it's not fitness related. It is just general. Um, I would even put in life optimization, if you will, like mm -hmm. entrepreneurship, how to just improve aspects of your life. And his audience are just very receptive to wanting to optimize their health. They're very receptive to improving themselves mentally, physically, spiritually. Um, and that's something that's kind of, which it lines very well with Merrick, but from a, you know, the strength or powerlifting space, yeah. it's a much different, different audience. Who are some other ones? Um, that's a great question. 
I feel really on the spot right now. I, that's that's, uh, yeah, I want to make you think. Yeah, you are. Well, so so in my role, in my role of marketing director, we it covers everything marketing. So pay, paid ads, brand awareness, social media, website, affiliates, partnerships. But yes, currently I I oversee and work yeah. that. But part of a big part of what I am doing in terms of building a team as our teams my marketing team's just grown rapidly and it's going to continue to grow is building team members that are going to oversee and can and have and will continue to oversee these departments because mm-hmm. i want to get to a point where affiliates and partnerships is is a separate person yeah, and yeah. Then just like blogs and newsletters is a person social mm-hmm. media is a person um but with that with that said um there's a there's a new guy he, he's he's got a hundred thousand so it's not it's it's not huge but it's small mm-hmm. it's, it's sean brady he's an mma fighter um he has been a great advocate for us and he's just recently shouted us he actually just shouted us out on rogan mm-hmm. uh recently about a month or two ago um he's one that probably not a lot of people may may know of, especially in this in this space but he's been a, been a great driver and what do you look for in the brand ambassadors so with our with our partners, we definitely look for ultimately the re- the quality of reach. So just to your point, yes, a million followers is yeah. like I'd rather have a hundred thousand with you know qualified quality. people than yeah. a million with not. So age is typically one. You know, Merrick Health we really focus on optimization. We're looking for people um, that are you know in their thirties, forties, etc. We help people in their twenties, but there's a lot of limitations, and we want to make sure that we're not we're setting them up for success. So audiences that are in that 30 plus range um we work really well with males we have about 10 percent of our audience of our clientele is female and we do really well with them uh, but males are a little bit easier to work with there's a lot more challenges with females and their hormones so with the with the partners that we're looking for we're looking for those that have really qualified uh, audience members and they want to improve themselves so whether it's their mind or body, they, you know, we want people that are going to push themselves. So whether it's into MMA or strength training or bodybuilding, um, those are all places that people are looking to make adjustments to uh, increase their you know, muscle mass or their mental capacity uh, or their, you know, cardiovascular capacity to mm-hmm. you know, fight. Where would be the best place for people to find you? Yeah, so so my nickname is a uh, little smoky. Um, so people may know me as that, and that it, it's because uh, when I was at Super Training Gym, yeah. Uh, like, how did that come? Yeah, to so I was at Super Training Gym, and um, essentially, you know, I'm I'm a shorter stockier individual so uh, a little smoky is i'm named after those little smoky sausages short short and fat like a little smoky sausage so that's my nickname and it's stuck stuck so much uh that I, even at merrick it's rolled over and people call me that as well so mainly just smoky but yeah the best way to find me is on instagram so little smoky st l-i-l smoky st and um yeah you people can message me i'd be happy to connect them whether it's for me personally, or they want to get connected with Merrick, I'd be happy to to help them out, connect them. Um, you can also f- find more information about Merrick um, on Instagram at Merrick Health or even our website, MerrickHealth.com. There you'll see all of our information, blogs, resources for the guided optimization that we provide that we discussed or the diagnostic lab testing. Were there any topics that you wanted to discuss that I didn't bring up? Uh, no, I think I I really was hoping to ask you a lot sure, more fire stuff. Away. <laughs> and, and, fire well, away. Well, uh, I guess uh, circling, we were talking about barbells earlier, and you mentioned you had 380 or 388 yeah. you touched. So of those, I'm assuming a majority are ones that you've are yours. Yeah. So which I mean, I have a feeling I know the answer to this, but what is what barbell, what bar I should say, stands out to the most of you that you're most proud of? The yoke bar. Okay. Because it was. Um, the original safety squat bar, kind of the, the long story behind this is I got to a point where I couldn't grab a bar anymore. Okay. Right. So because I, my shoulder, okay. you know, so it needs yep. replaced. So yep. it's, I've decided to not replace it and it's non-symptomatic to a degree, but there's loss of range of motion. that's never going to come back. So I can't grab the bar. Right. So <laughs> I love to squat. It's my downfall. You know, I love to squat, but, yep. and what I found with the original safety squat bar, short pad, you know, is my spine couldn't handle that compression week after week after week after week after week. So I wanted to fix that issue, you know, so a lot of time went into the pad design, you know, so it's, it's two different layers of foam. So one kind of forms to your back where if you look at a lot of 
you know, say higher density type pads, you can see daylight under mm -hmm. the shoulders with the pads where the first layer keeps that pad across the entire shoulder area. So it displaces the weight further mm -hmm. instead of, you know, straight down on the spine. And so that took a while, you know, to figure that out. We had to change the, um, the bend just a little bit because of the pad, you know, change as well. And that was fun during that time because we, we're not that smart, right? We're meatheads. So we had to figure out, will the bend hold, you know, so yeah. we would like take the monolift up as to the tallest person we could find to just have them dump it, yeah. you know, down onto boxes and shit and bars would break. And, you know, so we had to, we don't want that to happen. Right. Cause if somebody's doing a, I always thought if somebody's doing a suspended good morning, Okay. And it's super heavy and it comes down and the bar breaks, you're going to take their head off. Mm -hmm. You know, so that was my greatest fear. So with that one, it was just the process of coming up with it. And then it's what I use the most. So between that, you know, then, so there's that, the spider bar, and then a Mars bar. So I can still rotate bars now, just can't grab one. So th that's right up there first. Yeah. You know, after that one would probably be, um, the Swiss bar, you know, which was now the American press bar, mm -hmm. but, and, and again, that was because it hurt too bad at that time just to use regular bench grip, but I could use this grip, but there's no bar for that, you know? So we had to figure out you know, like what bar then what angle and kind of go down that direction there. So that would be another one of those. How many of your products are, have been created out of your personal necessity? Tons of them, almost all of them. You yeah. know, so if it was, I, I remember it's just a leg press. So the issue I was had with the leg press is I was a wide squatter. I couldn't go wide. Right. And then the other issue was the damn, the, the pad didn't adjust, mm -hmm. you know, so when I was big and fat, you know, you can barely get in it, you know, so that was kind of out of necessity. Can we make this? So this adjusts and be able to make it wider. Hack squat was another one because it always tore the shit out of my knees because the platform didn't adjust. So it's like, okay, we need to make one where the platform adjusts and hell, while we're at it, let's make it so you can do it sumo too. Yeah. Why not? Okay. Um, so that that's pretty much where all of it came from is because certain equipment I would like, but I wouldn't be able to use for whatever limitation it was. And, or I can't press, so I got to figure out a way to press and kind of go down that rabbit hole with those. Then one spirals into another, into another, into another. And um I guess if there's any mistake I made, I should have patented all this stuff. But mm. um, that just became this issue where I'd see other people in the industry that did that. Then they just spent more on legal fees yeah. than what they're actually gaining in sales. So it's like, well, fuck it. Just make a better quality and have a better brand and just realize it's going to get ripped off, you know, and just kind of go that route. What? Uh I have two more, one more, uh, what's the, your least favorite, like, or are you, what product are you least like excited about that you created or like, you're like, man, this is going to be the best thing ever. And it just became, whether it's kind of, it's almost all of them. <laughs> um, cause most of them don't hit. I mean, you kind of know that from super training, very few actually hit, um, probably the better, the better way to like t-shirt designs are a good example to kind of illustrate mm -hmm. this is you'll see it and be like, man, this is awesome. Like it's going to sell like crazy. Yeah. You don't sell any. Sure. And then it's like, this sucks. Then it sells. Yeah. Like, what the hell? You know, so that would be one. Um, trying to think of some of the other ones. Um, I thought the spider bar would do better, you know, because it's essentially just a cambered squat bar mm -hmm. with a yoke put on there. Um, shipping becomes prohibitive, you know, so that becomes that issue with that. And it's, you can't use it for a lot of things. You know, so I didn't have the foresight then to realize this is kind of like a, maybe a good morning, but it's kind of a crappy one, but it's just like a squat. Yeah. That's it. So there's no multi-use with that. Um, now, some of the things that are more multi-use, like the seated leg extension, leg curl, that does really well because it's multi-use, you know, so now the whole thing is whenever I look at anything, well, how many, how many things can this be used for? <laughs> And if it's just one, uh, we're not going to explore that. So I like your yoke bar. It's great for jam presses yeah. and other movements. Yeah. 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 Um, obviously, you're decked out in Merrick Health and we sponsor the show, but there's a there's a reason for that to start. I'd love to, if you could share your experience, like yes. the initial experience with yeah. why we even partnered up on that. I don't know if this would be a, the podcast it is now if it wasn't for you guys. Right. So that's uh, unbelievable to hear, by the way. No, it's, it's the truth because it's, you know, we've, we've been in the content business since 98. 
right? And as you know, content's not free to produce, right? You know, it, it costs to produce. You know, so over the years, as content's changed from blogs, articles, I mean, back before we had a Q&A and, you know, all these different things, you know, the, the Q&A kind of got replaced with, you know, Facebook, because now you can go directly to the coaches. Uh, the training logs got replaced with Instagram because now people can post it faster just on the Instagram. So, you know, those kind of go away. And then the um, the articles are the articles. You know, mm -hmm. people read less today than they did before. So as the content grows, it becomes more video based, which becomes more expensive, you know, to be able to do that, more personnel, you know, to be able to do that editing time, you know, all those things kind of play into that. So we hit this weird crossroads where I'm looking at the content expense and then looking at the content revenue. And it was very far off. Mm -hmm. And unlike others, we didn't build our shipping cost into product. We just kept it straight out what it was. Well, mm -hmm. people don't like that because now the shipping cost is higher than everybody else's, but fact is everybody else builds it in the product. We couldn't do that because all our expenses were going into the content. So we didn't have the margins to be able to build it into the product because that was there. So we had a, a pivot time to where the content, we had to let attriculate, you know, out, you know, to bare minimum and then slowly scale it back up and do things like actually monetize YouTube, you know, try to get sponsors for a podcast, try to get the content to just break even. And then, yes, it's still going to drive sales, but there's it's hard to track that, you know, as you, as you are well aware, yeah. right? You know it does, but how do you quantify that? And you can get kind of in the ballpark, kind of, but you never really know. And then if you just stop producing it, you find out real quick it wasn't what you thought it was. You know, it was more yeah. the other. So that's when you know, we got together and you were the first, you know, sponsor for that. And that alleviated a whole lot of stress right there because, okay, cool. This is going to take care of, you know, us, not all of it, but it's going to take care of a, a portion of it yeah. to where now we can, if we can stack more, then we can get to that break even. So you have the ad revenue from YouTube, which is variable, mm -hmm. you know, it's, is what it is. And then, but that's more constant. You know, then it became the conversation that we had, which was great. I wish everybody would do that. It's just, let's be transparent, mm -hmm. you know, so go with that. If it don't work, let us know, then we'll change whatever we need to do to be able to get you the return that you want and vice versa, mm -hmm. you know, with that, you know, so it's been an amazing thing. Plus that wasn't the whole, I'm not going to take any sponsor. Yeah. Right. And especially when my doctor is Eric Serrano. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, I have a counterbalance here. So I'm going to test this and I'm going to see how this will balance with what my primary care, which I still use, will say. And is it going to be the same? Because I, I can find out real quick if this is bullshit or not. Right. So I went through the whole process and the process was flawless and it was, you know, I'm very impressed, but the whole time I still like whatever, what I don't care until, you know, I meet with the physician yep. from your side and then I meet with Eric and then I see how this lines up. Right. Yep. Because that would have been the deal breaker. Like, no, this guy's free. This is, and it was very well paralleled, mm -hmm. very well paralleled to the point now where the biggest benefit I have is I have other physicians who so say, for example, an orthopedic or cardiologist or something like that. So say they want me to do something, you know, or take some med or whatever it's going to be. But then Eric says, no, now I got this balance. So boom, you know, here yeah. comes, you know, um, Hodgkins, yeah. right? What's your take on this? Without him knowing those two. Yeah. What's his take, right? So now I got a vote process. Like, okay, two to one, you yeah. know, here, you know, this is a go or no, two in the opposite direction. So it provides, and granted, not everybody's going to be able to be yeah. able to do this. They don't have that opportunity to be able to do that. But there hasn't been a single time where that didn't align. And I can say that it's actually, because it, I have the appointment with Merrick before I have it, mm -hmm. right? So then I have more information to be able to go in. Right. And the labs as well. Right. I, I did learn and I'll put this out there just for anybody. I did learn this before Merrick is I started doing my own labs, you know, through a different website and would just pay out of pocket. Mm -hmm. So then when I went to see my physician, it's like, here's my labs. 
let's have this conversation. Instead of what most people do is they go in there, get the labs and the physician calls and either yells at them or whatever it's going to be. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a very limited view. And um, so Merrick also kind of became that as yeah. well. So I have that. So then, then I go in. But that's kind of the whole spiel of the whole thing. And I want to thank you for the support, right? Yeah. Because it, it's helped more than I think you know, especially early on. And there's ebbs and flows, you know, sure. it's, that it's in there. So it it definitely helped tremendously. And it's a solid product. I have no problem referring this or putting this out to anybody. And I don't believe there's a single person that I've referred this out to, or nobody's ever came back to me yeah. and said anything. If there's any, anything bad, yeah. if there's anything that would be bad, it would be uh, the cost of all the supplements sure. and all the other stuff. Yeah. And all I tell them is, well, did you ask them what the priority was, you know, of these items, you know, because they don't have to take every sure. single thing's there, yeah. you know, because as you said, a lot of the supplements are farm grade and stuff like that. I don't suggest it, but they can go like a lesser grade and mm-hmm. kind of bridge the gap for a little while with that. But that that's a good problem. Yeah. You know, that's, that's, a, that's, that's, a, that's a good problem to have. So it's been a great experience. That's awesome. I love it. Yeah, it's been, um, we'll just real quick, just shout out to Zach behind, behind us for even like uh, kind of bringing me up to be yeah. a guest. And I'm just honored to to know you and have been, you know, I, I, I didn't circle back, but, you know, after I, I found Mark watching his content, as I started watching your, like, mm-hmm. so I've been watching your content for years and years and then have to be able to come here. Uh, I think it's my third or fourth time coming here now to, uh, you know, meet you and to be on the podcast is just an absolute honor. I mean, you're just such a great person, enjoyable person. Your, your whole team uh, has been a pleasure to work with in various capacities. So uh, you've built a really cool facility here, a really cool team. Um, Swiss, I'm a huge proponent of Swiss. I know, you know, we'll see it again at some yeah. point. I know it'll be around. Um, but uh, I just, again, really appreciate to be a part of your life and much it's just an honor no it's been great to sit down because the one thing i like about the podcast is i get to know people better Mm -hmm. because normally if i'm speaking to you it's like at a conference and it's like you know five minutes here 15 minutes here 10 minutes here and then we're on to the next thing this this long form has been a great time so i appreciate it thank you for coming out and guys we are done awesome All right, guys, we got new limited edition apparel. There's two designs, as with all the limited edition apparel. It's only while supplies last. This is the blue illusion tee, so I guess you can act like you're stronger than you really are. It's an illusion. And the other one, work harder, not lazier. Or you could just work really, really hard at being lazy. Doesn't matter to me. All that matters to me is that you support the podcast. So hit the link in the description or go to EliteFTS.com. And on the homepage, scroll down, you're going to see limited edition apparel. Click on there. Pick up your limited edition apparel today. Help support the podcast, podcast, podcast. Thank you. Americ Health is a premium telehealth platform specializing in hormone optimization and preventative medicine. Are you looking to optimize your health in and out of the gym, improve recovery, sex drive, and quality of life? Have you tried speaking to your health professional about this and have gotten the cold shoulder, stereotyped, or just told as part of getting older? Just go to AmericHealth.com backslash table talk and you can create your own lab or you can take labs that we've had set up for them, which are based upon the same labs that I've been doing over the last 15 years. Or you can use their guided optimization. With this, they'll put you in touch with a patient care coordinator, which is actually pretty cool because you get to sit down and speak to somebody that can understand what you're looking for from hormone optimization and the preventative and medicine standpoint. After that conversation, they'll determine which labs that you should and which tests you should have done. And then from there, get the labs done. They'll review those labs with you and put you in touch with one of their hormone optimization specialists that can determine which supplementation that you should use over the counter or prescription. MerrickHealth.com backslash Table Talk. The discount code is Table Talk. 
I think most of us would agree that getting a coach is a great step forward that an athlete can make to make greater progress. What if you had a whole bunch of coaches and a whole bunch of driven elite level athletes and like-minded people all in your corner trying to make you better? That's exactly what you're going to get with the Table Talk Discord crew. Would I join again? Absolutely. And I will continue to be a member of the Discord group as long as it's active. I've been a big fan of Table Talk over the last couple of years. It's one of my top podcasts that I listen to. So once Dave Tate announced that there would be a Discord crew. It was a no-brainer for me to join. It's been overwhelmingly positive experience. One of the biggest benefits of being in the Discord crew form checks. I work out in my garage by myself. I don't have people to cue me, to correct me, to coach me, anything like that. So being able to hop on the Discord, post my videos and having elite top level powerlifters and coaches able to give me real time feedback that, hey man, you need to tweak this, you need to work on this, do some more accessories here has been a huge, huge benefit. I've seen my progression as a lifter make jumps just because of that. There's so much info on the sport group for the members, thousands of articles, tons of eBooks. And really the best thing about it, it's like you're back in the gym, you're busting other people's balls sometimes. At the same time, you're getting really good information. It's been a blessing for me this last year and I really recommend it.